Hi, I'm Chris Cavus. I'm here with Xavier Vavasur. We're at the Surface Navy Association Symposium just outside Washington, D.C. It's a three-day event. Uh, it's been going, this is the third day uh, of the event, and we're just going to walk around the floor right now and see what people have been looking at all week. So why don't we go inside? This is the BAE Systems Display here at SNA. They've opened up with this nice uh, model of the dry dock Pride of California. It's a new dry dock for BAE Systems in San Diego, California. Uh, it's big enough to dock two destroyers, two early bird class destroyers at the same time. This is not a first, it happens from time to time, but it's been a while and this model and the, the, the photo up here depict uh, uh, the USS Decatur and USS Steedham that entered together last October out at San Diego. They're, they're going in for about six months. Uh, very, very picturesque. This is a great shot of air shot of the facility in San Diego, right by the the uh, Bay Bridge. Uh, one of the largest privately uh, held ship repair operations on the West Coast. Over here, BAE has a great display of their their precision guided munitions. This is a 127 millimeter hypervelocity projectile, HVP, that actually has already been fired from the Mark 45 five inch gun aboard the Arleigh Burke class destroyer Dewey in 28 tearing during the RIMPAC exercises. This up here is the Volcano uh, extended range version. This is also compatible with a Mark 45 uh, five inch gun on US Navy destroyers and cruisers. And this has a range of about 90 kilometers. Something brand new here at the show is a model from Fincantieri Marinette Marine of their shipyard in Marinette, Wisconsin, and the expansion plans that they have should they garner and win the U.S. Navy's FFGX frigate competition. Right now, of course, the yard is building, is in full production on uh, Freedom Class LCS-1 variant uh, littoral combat ships for the U.S. Navy, and they've just started fabrication of the first of four multi-mission surface combatants, MMSCs, for Saudi Arabia, which are a more robust version of the LCS, but the same size. The frigate, uh, should they win it, the frigate's actually about twice the size in, of display, in terms of displacement than the LCS right now. So this means that the company is going to have to expand the yard, modernize the yard, and these we have a new blast uh, facility here, blast and paint facility. Painting is a big deal. Uh, envi major environmental concerns. You want to do everything in a controlled uh, atmosphere. So they have a, have an area here. They would have another one because they are anticipate high rate of production on these. This is an entirely new uh, final hull erection and outfitting hull that would replace the existing uh, parking lot. So you lift it up. You see what's inside. So the ship in, in, the, in the erection hall is assembled from all the, all the various modules. There will actually be four modules, uh, forward section, midsection, aft section, and the superstructure block will actually come from, uh, will be its own module to be dropped on. When, when the ship is ready, it's assembled, it rolls out on dollies, all computer controlled, very tight tolerances, but it's very precise navigation. It'll come in here, it'll turn, come back and then go back up on the synchro lift from synchro, eventually when they're ready to put in the water synchro lift will just lower the ship in and float it off so very gentle very very efficient way of uh, construction uh, much safer for the ship much less wear and tear but this will happen no matter what this of course will will be built this major hall will be built should they get the contract now, of course, the contract uh, expected that later, probably late summer, uh, early fall of uh, this year, July, August, September, uh, the U.S. Navy is expected to award a de detailed design and construction contract for the frigate. It's a very lucrative contract. There will be at least 20 of these ships. This initial contract will be for one ship plus uh, with options for nine more, but a, but a, but a major uh, effort right now. And over here, Pincantieri has a brand new model of their FFGX frigate proposal. This, of course, is based on the Italian Frem frigate. Uh, the, the concept was first shown last year. This is by far the most elaborate model that they've had on display 
so far. Fincantieri, um, and along with Austell USA, are the only two of the four competitors who are showing the, their designs to the public. General Dynamics has a, an image of theirs, but no model. Uh, Huntington Ingalls has, has no model and no image and no discussion. So a lot of, part of the discussion of the show is, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Obviously, you see Fincant Fincantieri making a major effort to show what they're up to. And now, let's go on. We're here at L3 Harris with Dan Imbout. He's the Director of Business Development for Hybrid Quadrotor Unmanned Aerial Systems at uh, L3. Uh, Dan, this is a really interesting model. What is this? Hey, Chris, this is the uh, FVR90. So we, we call it the Fixed Wing VTOL Rotator. It's a 117 pound uh, vertically takeoff and landing UAV. So it has a combination of a quadcopter, the four quadcopters that you see in coordination with a fixed wing plane. Uh, gives you all the benefit of taking off vertically like a helicopter uh, with all the benefits of a fixed wing long endurance uh, aircraft. This thing can fly for 8 to 18 hours uh, and carries a payload upwards of 23 pounds up in the nose. And we also have hard points where we can carry 10 pounds uh, symmetrically on each side or, or 5 pounds asymmetric. So if the customer has things that they want to carry, uh, they can do that well. You know, primary mission is uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. You can see here we have our Westcam MX-8 ball installed in front. Uh, and it gives you EO, day EO, and IR capabilities. Um, you know, we are here at uh, Surface Navy now to, to show this capability. Um, we just completed a cruise uh, off Fiji last month and have flown, uh, you know, 241 hours from uh, the research vessel Falcor for the Schmidt Ocean Institute and uh, had demonstrated really good flying on and off a moving platform and uh, we, you know, we believe that there are a lot of applications now that we can do for the Navy and for our partner nations uh, you know, across the globe. So what, what's the payload capacity of this? Payload capacity, we can carry upwards of 23 pounds of uh, payload up in a modular nose uh, that you can remove uh, from the front of the aircraft. And you're, you're building one of these systems right now for the U.S. Army, is that yes, right? Yes, we've been selected as uh, part of the Army's future tactical UAS program. Uh, so we're one of four vendors providing this uh, to the brigade combat teams for an evaluation over the next 18 months. Okay, well thanks Dan, very interesting. Thanks Chris. Over at General Dynamics, there's a model here from the General Dynamics NASCO shipyard in San Diego of the USNS John Lewis. This will be TAO 205. This is the first of a new class of oiler for the U.S. Navy. They'll be operated by the Military Sealift Command. The first ship is under construction right now in San Diego. She's about 70% complete, will be launched later this year, probably in her service uh, next year in 2021. Uh, the second ship already is under construction behind her. Uh, GD NASCO has a contract for six of these ships. The U.S. Navy expects to buy up to 20 of them, so there'll be another competition later on. But uh, this is, this is uh, the major naval ship now under construction now uh, by GD NASCO in San Diego. We're here at General Electric Global Research with Chip Cotton. He's the program manager for energy research and development. Um, these are 3D printing displays here. Most people think about 3D printing, they think about things that are relatively flimsy, plastic, single-use stuff, uh, things you can make on the spot but not very robust. But that's not what General Electric is doing here, is it, Chip? No, not at all. We, we believe that a lot of the polymer printing that you see is becoming fairly ubiquitous. So we're much more focused on different metals so in different modalities of the metal printing. So we have a couple examples here from both uh, two different types of laser metals, including the, the electron beam laser. And then we also, what we don't have depicted here is our latest technologies, our binder jet, which is very similar to an inkjet. So one of the things that caught my eye here, this uh, component here, um, relatively lightweight, it's metal. This is actually titanium, 
Now, titanium has a reputation for being very difficult to work with, very expensive. Uh, it's it's not, not the kind of thing that uh, you do casually. But this is a 3D printing, printed component built of titanium. The, how does that work? The titanium in that is actually a, a lighter, so that, you know, the lightness actually even helps in the shipboard applications. But the, the simplicity of that design is probably indicative of a new customer. So when we're first working with a new customer, you don't pick something that's flight critical that's going to fall out of the air when you do it. You pick an easy part so that you can learn the process. How do you qualify that? How, how, you know, I've been traditionally casting those, right. and now all of a sudden I come along with this fancy machine and print it. How am I assured that what I've given them is of equal value?